Welcome to the Answers for Elders radio show. Meet the trusted experts who will give you straight answers and will help guide you on the path of later life care. Now, here's your host, founder, caregiver, and CEO, Suzanne Newman. And welcome everyone back to Answers for Elders radio network. And I am here again with attorney Andrea Lee, and she is an estate planning and elder law attorney with Legacy Estate Planning in Bellevue, Washington. <clears throat> Andrea, this has been a very enlightening um, hour, and I would like to just zero in um, mm-hmm. in our final segments, and I want to talk to a family caregiver um, right now. There's, I think, 70 million family caregivers, unpaid family caregivers, that are providing care a minimum of 20 hours a week to a loved one. Or there might be a spouse, they might be a daughter or son. Um, What documents legally and what kind of legal um, uh, aspects should they be making sure that what bases are covered? What are the tips you have? Wow, there are so many tips that can go out there. And, you know, I'm going to share my own experiences, my own tips that I have you know, working as an elder law attorney for, you know, 15 years, and then my own experiences as a caregiver to my mom, who Mm -hmm. has dementia and um, is still at home with my dad. So the basic legal tools that they need um, are so important to have them in place. They're the financial power of attorney, because that's the document that says, hey, if this person you know, if my parent is incapacitated, my parent is not able to make competent decisions on their own, can I make sure I have access to managing their finances? Yeah. Can I make sure their bills are being paid? Um, you know, if my dad starts accidentally giving money away because he got an email from the prince of Uganda trying to get money, do I have a way to help him out and support yeah. him and advocate for him financially and legally? Mm-hmm. So that's the financial power of attorney. And that's essential. It's also essential for caregivers because um, as people age and the families come to me, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this in episode, maybe a future one. One thing we explore is paying for long-term care. Yeah. How can people afford long-term care? How can we provide long-term care? And um, within a family dynamic, we can sometimes preserve assets But if that financial power of attorney is not up to date and properly done, we are losing opportunities to protect hundreds of thousands of dollars of of the incapacitated person's finances. So that's extremely important. Second is that healthcare power of attorney. Um, Suzanne, as you probably know, and as probably many of our listeners know, in the families, oftentimes it falls to one child to be kind of the primary caregiver. Yeah. <laughs> nine, nine times out of 10. Yeah. yeah. And there's just one child um, who steps up and they kind of step in and they start managing affairs. Mm-hmm. And if you are a parent and you have a child who is helping you, then you should take a moment to thank them because they are kind of the unsung heroes of caregivers. Absolutely. Um, but Sometimes families don't, they fail to recognize um, the challenges that those caregivers might face. Mm-hmm. And the the children who are not caregivers are sometimes so critical of the care that their sis, sis, brother or sister is giving their, their mom and dad. They might be um, giving them, harassing them about decisions that they're making, you know, trying to tell them what to do. So that healthcare power of attorney where you name that primary caregiver as the person that you trust to make these important medical decisions for you are essential. Yeah. And Andrea, you say that and it's so important. I always advocate that whoever's on the front line caring for mom and dad, everybody else in the family needs to support them. And, And that means sometimes they don't agree with the decision, but they're not there every day. They don't know what is, you know, and the thing is your mom has dementia. So, you know, in the earlier stages of dementia, um, you'll say, oh, mom's, you know, she's starting to lose it and all that stuff. And then, you know, brother and sister show up for a visit and Mm -hmm. mom just, everything looks fine, you know, and then she falls apart. This They can get themselves up to a certain degree. So it's hard 
to, to, you know, to be questioned when you know that somebody's slipping down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. The point that I'm making is that family caregiver's experience is very different than anybody else's in the family. 100%. It's so very different. And I think the outsiders who are witnessing what's going on, they just don't have that day-to-day -day experience of taking care of a parent week to week to understand the pressure that that caregiver is mm -hmm. in. Very and, true. And as an adult, um, it's so important that you make sure you empower the people who will be caring for you mm -hmm. because they're going to be not only caring for you, but they might be having to deal with the challenges of their siblings. So right. giving them those powers and those legal documents is mm -hmm. just taking an additional burden off of their shoulders. Yeah. So and can so, I interject something yeah. in there with this whole thing? I think there's one responsibility that a caregiver has that they may not realize is that important. And that is the responsibility of communication. I think a lot of families are very interested, but they don't number one, know how to ask. They don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a crisis or when somebody needs help, a caregiver needs help, there isn't enough foundational knowledge with the, within the family. And so I always advocate Find a method that works, but have a weekly or, you know, bike weekly touch base call with your family members. And I know you're grinning here. So now, I would I, love I, to have your, your review on that one. Okay. That is such a great point that you make because sometimes my clients will sit across from me and I'm talking to them about, and maybe they have three daughters and <laughs> they love all three of their daughters and all three of their daughters, you know, are responsible adults and they trust all of them. And they're mm -hmm. asking me, well, how do we pick? How do we pick which daughter? And I actually say, well, all things being equal, pick the best communicator. Yeah. Pick the one who plans the birthday parties. Pick the one who's reaching out to his or her siblings and who's a good communicator. Yeah. And that's because just like you said, so much conflict in families are, are, arrive because of a lack of communication yeah you know you have that one that one child who you've named and maybe they're a great caregiver and they're managing the finances and they're doing everything and they're just super busy and they're doing their very very best but mm -hmm. the other kids are over here saying what's going on we don't know what's going on we're yeah. you know and they're they're it's building anxiety in them because they feel like they're being left out yes so i think what you said was absolutely fabulous advice the person and the agent should be a good communicator. And I think those weekly calls or, you know, weekly email summaries mm -hmm. are a fantastic way for family members to decrease conflict and yeah. keep things smooth. And if you don't hear from the loved one that's the caregiver, then you reach out to that caregiver, that family Finally. person and say, hey, I'm just curious about you. How are you doing? And the most important thing is, are they taking care of themselves? I think a lot of times they don't take care of themselves. Um, <clears throat> they find that, you know, they're not getting enough sleep. They are, you know, they're overwhelmed. Um, the sandwich generation, like you talk about, a lot of these family caregivers, they've got kids at home and maybe they moved their parents in with them. So they're in the same house of, you know, five people <clears throat> that are dependent on them. That's a huge amount of responsibility. And what are they doing to feed themselves, take care of themselves? So that's a whole other piece that certainly, um, you know, I think about with families, are you having the right kind of dialogue? Are you connected? If, you know, mom and dad, if dad's got Alzheimer's and mom is there taking care of him. How is mom getting fed? You know, what is, she, what can you do to help mom? I think that's one of the key things in all of this. Right. Absolutely. I think there is, um, I think like we said earlier, typically in a family, there's one child who kind of steps in, takes charge. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think I was the child, I was that child in my family. Um, sure. I've said my mom has dementia. She lives at home with my dad. Um, and she was diagnosed, I think, in around 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. So that was 10 years ago. And, you know, we've experienced so many stages of dementia when she was really angry, um, you know, distrustful of my dad, thinking he was cheating on her. Oh, um, I know. You know, all those terrible things that happen when someone has dementia. 
And I think as the caregivers, um, one of the things is, like you said, how do you stay healthy yourself and how can you set kind of boundaries yeah. and let things go a little bit, which I think if you're like me, I mean, I'm an attorney, I'm a mom, I'm a caretaker, and I am just used to being in charge of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to be willing to take a step back and say, this is something I can hand to somebody else. Mm -hmm. They might not do it the way that I would want to mm -hmm. do it. They might, you know, it might be different, but I have to be able to unload a little bit of that responsibility right. and pass right. it on to someone else. And I'm sure with you working with families every day, you're seeing the dynamics in the family. Um, when you say it's primarily one person <clears throat> that's doing all the work, it's like, I guess the question that I would ask for everyone else in the family is what are you doing to support that person? Mm -hmm. And that's the key of making sure that you have a solidified and uh, you know, in streamline and, and harm, harmony, harmonizing family unit that can move forward with the care of a loved one. And I think that's, a, it's, it's a big thing, especially if, Hey, I should have been the power of attorney. I should have been this, but that's not who mom and dad chose. And so having, getting that done early in advance, um, then there's no surprises, right? Everybody already knows. Yeah. 100%. It, obviously, we went back to choosing the right person who would be your agent. It needs to be someone organized. It needs to be someone who communicates well. It needs to be someone that you trust and who has similar values to you. Yes. And hopefully, that person is able to navigate the relationships that, that are going to happen between their siblings or the other potential agents. Yeah. And finding a way to continue to provide mom or dad or whomever it is that they're the agent for appropriate care, um, make good decisions on their behalf, but also make sure they're getting the care they need so that yeah. they can have their own lives. They, you know, as a caregiver, most caregivers don't have only one person they're taking care of. Most no. caregivers are husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, um, partners, working full time and they're just I was going to say else. I think I think the statistics are according to the, the National Alliance of Caregiving 40% job loss of someone that's a, a the family caregiver that's overwhelming when you think about it the the right. overwhelming and stress that goes on 100% and then I think unfortunately what sometimes happens uh, where that lack of communication then comes in hey if a child leaves their job to take care of mom or dad, then they should somehow be be reimbursed for that mm -hmm. loss of job. Well, and there's also the um, Family Protection Act that is part of a legal law. If you have to leave for a care of a loved one, you should be, you know, paid. You should get paid leave, and you should be authorized for that. And so that's a whole other thing we could talk about someday. One hundred percent. I think that we should have another webinar, and we should talk a little bit about taking care of the caregiver. Like, Amen to that care. one. Yeah. How do we take care of the yeah. caregiver? Andrea, it has been such a delight to have you with us this hour, and I am looking forward to a lot more information that you're going to be getting from um, the various uh, things that Legacy Estate Planning does in Bellevue. And um, for those of you that are interested, please go to Answers for Elders, um, and you can get all the information about Legacy Estate Planning. And um, we are look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you again. We at Answers for Elders thank you for listening. Did you know that you can discover hundreds of podcasts in our library on senior care? So visit our website and discover our decision guides that will help you also navigate decision making. Find us at AnswersForElders.com.